The unit of measure is the ampere, amp for short. Ampere, a measure of the amount of electric current moving past a point in an electric circuit in one second. Amperes are measured with an ammeter. Ammeters should not be connected the same way as voltmeters. Remember, because of its high resistance, the voltmeter was connected in parallel and sampled the current. The ammeter is connected in series so that all the current that flows through the circuit also flows through the ammeter. The ammeter offers very little resistance and, when hooked up correctly, causes very little change in current flow. Like the voltmeter, the ammeter must be properly aligned with the direction of current flow. The negative contact on the meter receives current from the negative pole of the dry cell. Current flows through the meter and returns to the dry cell's positive pole. Remember, with ammeters and voltmeters, connections are always negative to negative and positive to positive. I'll add this one to our original circuit. Remember, all the current going through the circuit must pass through the ammeter. So I must connect the meter in series, and the meter must be aligned with the flow of current from negative to positive. Now in this example, current will flow from the negative pole of the dry cell through this wire, through the light. I'm going to connect the negative contact of the ammeter here, so current will flow through the ammeter to the positive contact. I'll connect the wire to the positive contact so that the current can flow back to the positive pole of the dry cell. The idea again is that all the current will flow through both the light and the ammeter. And the ammeter says about six one hundredths amps are flowing through this circuit. So let's record that. In the one cell circuit, 600 amperes are flowing. What do you think will happen if I put two dry cells in the circuit? Let's give that a try. Now the ammeter says about 10 one hundredths or one tenth ampere is flowing. So let's record that. In the two cell circuit, we have 10 one hundredths amperes flowing. Let's try three dry cells. Now the ammeter reads about 12 one hundredths amps. Let's record that. In the three cell circuit, we have 12 one hundredths amperes flowing. Now that you've seen the ammeter work, I need to add a word of caution. Never, never connect the ammeter in a circuit that doesn't have a source of resistance like this light bulb. The ammeter itself has a very low resistance to the flow of electrons. Connection in a circuit without a source of resistance could result in damage to the ammeter and short-circuiting the power source. Watch as I hook up the voltmeter so that we can monitor volts and amperes at the same time. Do you remember how the voltmeter is connected? In parallel, across the resistance, and in line with current flow. Negative to negative, positive to positive. The addition of the voltmeter should not make a significant difference to the way the ammeter functions. The reverse is also true. The ammeter does not significantly affect the voltmeter. The meters should read the same as they did when they were connected independently. Now this time, the ammeter says about 12 one hundredths amps, and the voltmeter says about four and a half volts. If we look at the record, we see that that's what we got before. Now, if we try two dry cells, let's see if that holds true. This time, we've got about three volts and about one-tenth ampere. Let's look at the record. They're the same again. Let's try one cell. This time, we've got one and a half volts and six one hundred amps. And looking at the record, that's what we got before. Now we've reached that third characteristic of electric circuits, resistance. Any condition that limits the flow of electrons in an electric circuit. Now, this light bulb is part of the circuit and it offers resistance. These wires offer some resistance, but not very much. This resistance can be measured. 
in ohms. Ohms, a measure of the amount of resistance in an electric circuit. If you had to memorize all this stuff about volts, amps, and ohms without something to tie it all together, it could get pretty confusing. Fortunately, a 19th century school teacher named Georg Ohm has come to the rescue. He experimented with the flow of electricity through wires of different resistances and discovered a beautiful relationship. It's called, cleverly enough, Ohm's Law. And here's what it looks like. It seems that amperes equal volts divided by ohms. Or you can rewrite it as volts equals amperes times ohms. Or ohms equals volts divided by amperes. We can calculate the resistance in our circuit using this relationship. If ohms equals volts divided by amperes, what's the resistance in the one dry cell circuit? Well, ohms equals 1.5 volts divided by 0 0.06 amperes. That means we've got 25 ohms of resistance. Try the calculation for the two cell circuit. Three volts this time divided by 0 0.10 amps equals 30 ohms, a bit higher than the one cell circuit. And how about the three cell circuit? 4.5 volts divided by 0 0.12 amps equals 37.5 ohms higher again. Why the differences in resistance? We never changed the light bulb or added other sources of resistance. Well, if you don't know already, we'll solve that mystery shortly, but right now, I want to talk to you about some other meters. Ohm meters, and I've got two examples here. Actually, these are volt and ammeters too. They're called multimeters, but we're only concerned about the ohm meter part right now. The ohmmeter's got its own power source, some batteries. And this one has a digital display instead of a needle. Ohmmeters should never be connected to a circuit when current is flowing. Since the ohmmeter has its own source of current, it takes the place of any other source. In our circuit, it'll take the place of the dry cell. So, we don't have to worry about the direction of current flow. When we attach it to the circuit, the ohmmeter measures the resistance of the circuit to its own current. In a way, these meters perform the Ohm's law calculation for you, since volts and amps are predictable based on the power source and the circuitry in the meters themselves. The manufacturer has been able to construct an Ohm scale based on the possible results of Ohm's law calculations. So, when the meter is connected, current from the battery in the meter flows through this circuit back to the meter, and the scale reads the resistance of this circuit to the flow of that current. Now, most of the resistance is in this light bulb. Now, remember, we calculated from 25 to 37.5 ohms for this circuit, depending on the number of cells. Now, this meter says, 4.3 ohms. Now what's going on here? There's a clue in something that was easily seen in the first circuits we tested. Do you recall? As we added more dry cells, the light got brighter. That's because as the current increased, the filament got hotter and glowed brighter. As the glowing filament heats up, resistance increases. I'll show you. First, we'll connect the dry cells to the light, and the filament will start to glow and heat up. Now what I'm gonna do is to disconnect the current and then quickly attach the ohmmeter, and watch what happens to the resistance should be pretty warm by now. Detach the current, attach the ohmmeter. Look what happens to the resistance. When the current stops flowing through the glowing filament, it begins to cool, the light fades, and as you can see, the resistance drops quickly. The real world
world of electronics is not as predictable as Ohm's law. Many times things don't turn out the way you might expect. Connections might be bad, meters might be broken or improperly adjusted, maybe because of misuse. I hope not by you. When using the multimeter to measure volts and amps, the basic connections are the same as with the volt and ammeters we used before. Now first, I'll return one dry cell to our circuit. Make the connection so the current flows through the bulb and it will glow dimly as it did before. Now to test for voltage, I'll set the scale on this multimeter into the DCV area, that's direct current volts, and I'll set it at two. Now that's because the voltage in this circuit couldn't be much over one and a half, and two is the next highest division on the scale. Remember, voltmeters are connected in parallel, that is across the resistance, negative to negative and positive to positive. Well, we'll make the connections on this one negative to negative, positive to positive, and the multimeter is telling us that we have 1.521 volts flowing in this circuit. Now, if we look back at the record, we see we had 1.5 volts in the one cell circuit before, so that's pretty close. And the digital display on this meter makes it really easy to read. As a matter of fact, the voltage has dropped a little bit while we've been talking. Now we have 1.520 volts. When using meters that offer various ranges for volts, amps, or ohms, choose the setting that's nearest to but greater than the range of values you might find. For instance, I chose two because I know I'm working pretty close to one and a half volts or less. If I want to measure with two dry cells in the circuit, I'll have to set the meter at 20, the next higher setting, because three is greater than two. And I could have three volts in the circuit. In cases where you don't know what the voltage might be, you start with the highest setting on the meter and work back until you get a satisfactory reading. This procedure guards against overloading and damage to the meter. Now to measure amperes, I'll change over to the DCA scale. That's direct current amperes and change the probe from the volt contact to the ampere contact. Now, as you might remember, ammeters are connected in series, negative to negative, positive to positive. The reading will be less than one amp, so I've set the scale accordingly. Make the connections, negative to negative, positive to positive, and the meter tells us we've got 0 0.068 amperes. Now, if we look back at the record from before, we see that's pretty close. I think that's about enough for now. I hope you'll be able to make use of some meters like these on your own. If you're not sure the proper procedures for connecting the meters you've got, ask questions. Better safe than sorry. And thanks for watching. today is to learn the proper use of a compound microscope.
One of the limitations on scientific observation is what we're able to see. Many things are just too small to be seen with the unaided eye. To look into the world of tiny things, we need some tools, like these microscopes. Microscopes have been around in various forms for hundreds of years. A magnifying glass is a simple microscope. Single lenses that could magnify 10 to 20 times were used during the Middle Ages. Greater magnification can be achieved by using two lenses. The second lens magnifies the image already enlarged by the first. Microscopes that have more than one lens are called compound microscopes. The first one known was assembled around 1590. Microscopes reveal otherwise unseen worlds. Imagine the surprise when folks learned that the water they drank contained tiny living things or saw blood circulating through the capillaries in a fish's tail. Come to think of it, if you haven't used a microscope, you'll probably be surprised too. So let's get started by learning about the parts of a microscope. The following are some parts of the compound microscope you should learn. Base, the base supports the microscope. Mirror, the mirror reflects light upward. Lamp. Sometimes a microscope has an electric lamp instead of a mirror. Diaphragm. An iris or disc diaphragm is used to control the amount of light that reaches the specimen you wish to observe. Stage. The stage is a platform which supports the microscope slide. Arm. The arm of the microscope supports the tube containing the lenses. It also provides a handle by which the microscope may be carried. Objectives. The objectives are lenses of varying strengths. Nose piece. The nose piece holds the objectives and may be rotated to change magnification coarse and fine adjustments. The coarse and fine adjustments are used to focus the magnified image so that you can see it clearly. Eyepiece. The eyepiece is the part you look through. It contains additional magnifying lenses. The parts vary a bit from scope to scope, but I think you get the idea. Now, when you carry a microscope, you place one hand on the arm and the other under the base and you set it down gently. Rough handling can jeopardize a pretty expensive investment. I start by lining up the lowest power objective. You'll feel it click into place. If your microscope has a mirror instead of a lamp, like this one does, you must adjust the mirror so that it reflects a good source of light upward through the objective. Now be careful. You don't want to reflect direct sunlight or any other intense source of light through the lenses because bright light can cause serious damage to your eyes. Microscopes with lamps are easier to use. Just turn those on and hope that the light bulb works. The diaphragm allows you to vary the amount of light that gets to your objective. Of course, it's hard to determine how much light you want until you've got something to look at. So I'm going to try a piece of newsprint. I'll use this setup so that you can see what's going on, which brings us to an important point. Lining up the specimen, focusing so that you can see something. Remember, we already moved the low power objective into place. It's a good idea, especially when you're new at this, to begin with the lowest power magnification because your field of view will be the widest possible. This makes it easier to locate what you want to see. Now to focus, you watch from the side and turn the course adjustment to move the slide and the objective very close to but not touching each other. Now look through the eyepiece and slowly move the slide and objective apart, again using the course adjustment until things come into focus. Then use the fine adjustment to sharpen the image. Now the reason for this procedure is to avoid damaging the lenses and slides by running them together. Once you've got things focused, you can look around. 
Some scopes are equipped with mechanical stages that make controlled movements easier. Whatever the case, move the slide around and see what happens. The first thing you'll notice is that everything is backwards. I mean, when you move the slide to the right, it seems to move to the left. And when you move it to the left, it seems to move to the right. If you move it uh, towards you, it seems to move away. And if you move it away from you, it seems to move towards you. The lenses do this. Now, you might want to find out how. Come to think of it, you could make some lenses. There are some good books that can give you instructions, but that's another story. Practice moving the specimen until you feel comfortable with it. These skills will come in handy when you need to follow microorganisms as they move around. While you're observing, use the diaphragm to vary the amount of light that reaches your eye. The amount of light will greatly influence what you see. You may want to adjust the light level when you move to a higher magnification, which is the next step. The first thing you need to do is center what you want to look at. looks like the letter E. Move the objective and the slide apart with the course adjustment. Switch to the next higher power. And as before, watch from the side and use the course adjustment to move the objective and slide very close to but not touching each other. Then, just as before, look through the eyepiece, move the objective and slide apart using the course adjustment until the image comes into focus. Use the fine adjustment to sharpen the image. Now, the greater magnification makes a big difference. Movement of the slide, even a tiny bump, looks like an earthquake. So practice moving the slide and using the diaphragm to vary the amount of light. When you're finished using the microscope, clean the stage and lenses. And be sure to use lens paper or some other approved cleaning materials when you clean the lenses. Your teacher will tell you what to do. It's really important because scratched and dirty lenses are a common and avoidable problem. Now, you'll probably be able to look at some prepared slides in class. But I think the most fun comes from making your own. Here's how. First thing you do is acquire some samples of pond water. Now be sure to get some of that material like algae and bottom sediment. Sample several different areas. You place a drop of your water sample on the slide. Just a drop now. Be neat about it. And next, you use a cover slip to cover the drop. Now, to do this without creating a bunch of air bubbles, you touch the edge of the cover slip to the edge of the drop, as I'm doing here. It'll kind of run along the edge and then slowly lower the cover slip onto the drop. Air won't become trapped quite as easily. The drop of water is kind of sandwiched between the cover slip and the slide, and it won't dry out for quite a few minutes. This arrangement is called a wet mount. Now you proceed just as I showed you before. You use the course adjustment to move the lowest power objective very close to, but not touching, the slide. You look through the eyepiece, use the course adjustment to bring things into focus, sharpen the image using the fine adjustment. And if you're lucky, you'll see a tiny community in there. Experiment with the different amounts of light by adjusting the diaphragm. Move the slide around to see everything that's there. Try to follow some of those little swimmers that go by. A number of things don't like the light and heat, so you'll have to chase them a bit. You can put some strands of cotton in the drop that makes little roadblocks that helps to slow down traffic. There are also some liquids that you can use. They thicken the water and make it harder for the organisms to swim. But check with your teacher for suggestions. 
choose one of those little organisms that will sit still for you and try examining it under higher magnification. Now you'll probably have to adjust the light level and do some practice with moving it around. Sometimes you can get a better look at things by staining them. I've made a wet mount of some onion tissue. Here's what it looks like without stain. Just shades of gray. But if we add some stain, things change. I've added some methylene blue solution to this one. Look at the difference. The stain dissolves in the water, enters the cells, and stains some of the parts. Methylene blue stains these nuclei especially well. Here's what the onion tissue looks like stained with iodine. A little bit of a difference. Now, other stains are used for other things, and you'll probably want to investigate some of them. Now, suppose you want to observe for an extended period of time, and your wet mound keeps drying out. Well, try this. Find a small test tube and dip the open end of it into some petroleum jelly, just a little bit. And touch that open end to your slide, making a ring of the petroleum jelly. Put your drop of water inside that ring and then place the cover slip on top of all that. Now this makes a fairly tight seal and it really slows down the rate of evaporation. There's some other little tricks you'll want to learn, like the hanging drop, but I've talked enough. You need to practice and explore on your own. Thanks for watching. today is to learn how to use a laboratory balance to measure mass. One kind of scientific observation that comes in handy is measuring mass, the amount of matter in an object. We can measure mass with a simple balance by comparing an unknown mass with a known standard. Now let's say we're working with the block standard. These blocks will be the standard of measure. All the blocks are exactly the same, each block having a mass of one block. Now, I'm making all this up, of course, but for the sake of discussion, let's say that we agree on using the block standard. So we run into this unknown mass and want to measure it. We must compare it to the known blocks. They're pretty easy, really. We'll use a balance first thing we have to do is to make sure the balance balances. And this one looks 
like it's doing so. Next, we add the unknown, which immediately unbalances things. Now, on the other side, we add the known blocks. It looks like the unknown has a mass of three blocks. I'd have been in trouble if I needed a fraction of a block, wouldn't I? But I think you get the point. Measuring mass involves comparing unknowns with known standards. You know your body mass. Maybe you express it in pounds. A pound is a known standard. Another standard unit of measure is the gram. We can find the mass of this unknown in grams by using a triple beam balance. Although it doesn't look much like it, this triple beam works on the same principle as the simple balance we used before. An unknown mass is compared with a known standard. These three beams are able to move in seesaw fashion. They support movable riders of known mass. The unknown mass goes here on the pan. And this pointer indicates when the known and unknown masses are in balance. You begin by checking to see that the balance is in balance to start with. The balance needs to be on a level surface and the riders in the zero position. If this is so, the pointer should swing equally on both sides of the zero mark. It will eventually settle down, but it's important that it be moving freely to start with. That way you can avoid being fooled by equipment that just gets stuck. If things don't line up properly, some fine tuning is in order. This little knob screws in and out and acts as a sort of a counterbalance. A turn or two may be necessary to set things right. So let's try it. Here's our unknown, the one that weighs three blocks. And we'll begin by moving the largest rider, the one marked in hundreds of grams, and we move that as many places to the right as we can until the balance tips. Then we back up one. Repeat the process with the rider marked in tens of grams, as many notches to the right as we can go until the balance tips. Then we back up one. And finally, with the rider marked in grams, moving it to the right, until we achieve balance. Now to read the result. It's an addition problem, really. We've got 100 grams plus 10 grams plus 1 and 7 tenths grams. That's 111 and 7 tenths grams. Because balance is a delicate thing, you need to be careful when you work with this equipment. As always, reckless use soon messes things up. You'll find several types of balances used in the laboratory. A simple spring balance, which uses a stretching spring to measure mass. Once the zero point is set, all you have to do is to hang the unknown mass on the hook. Of course, this type of balance is not appropriate for work requiring great precision, but it may be adequate for your needs which is an important point. You should choose your equipment based on the size of the error you can tolerate. If you must measure to the nearest tenth of a gram, this balance is not for you. The best you could do would be a rough estimate. You need a balance that is accurate to tenths of grams or smaller gradations, perhaps like the triple beam balance. First, zero the balance. Move all the riders to the zero position and make any fine adjustments necessary. Place the mass to be measured on the pan. Largest rider to the right until the balance tips, then back up one unit. Repeat with the next largest rider.
Finally, balance the mass with the smallest rider. Add the values indicated to determine the mass. This triple beam works in almost the same way. The difference is a dial that's used to make the final adjustment to achieve balance. Here's a high form triple beam which makes use of a different kind of dial. The numbers on the outside of this dial make up a vernier scale. The procedure for using this balance is much the same as for the triple beam without a vernier scale. First, zero the balance. Move all the riders and the dial to the zero position and make any fine adjustments necessary. to be measured on the pan. Move the largest rider to the right until the balance tips. Then back up one unit of measure. Repeat with the next largest rider. Finally, balance the mass by moving the dial. Add the values indicated to determine the mass. This dial and vernier scale are a little tricky to read. Each of these lines on the dial represents one-tenth gram. A vernier, this other scale beside the dial, breaks down these values in one-hundredth gram increments. To determine the mass, read the lowest gram value next to the zero on the vernier. In this case, we've got six and seven-tenths grams. Then look for the vernier graduation that most closely lines up with any one of the dial graduations. Here it's three one hundredths. Add the two together, we get six and seventy-three one hundredths grams. Try another. Read the lowest gram value next to the zero on the vernier. In this case, we've got three and two-tenths grams. Then look for the vernier graduation that most closely lines up with any one of the dial graduations. Here it's nine hundredths. Add the two together, we get three and twenty-nine hundredths grams. You may have the chance to use an electronic balance. This one zeroes at the touch of a button and automatically measures whatever mass is placed on the pan. Sometimes electronic balances and computers work together. For instance, some software packages will automatically sample and plot changes in mass over time. Measuring mass is an important part of scientific observation, so take time to learn how to use laboratory balances properly. Thanks for watching.